In this segment, we will review a patient's journey through the clinical diagnosis, staging, and treatment selection in advanced medullary thyroid cancer. Patients with early stage disease have a favorable prognosis, but once distant metastases develop, survival drops to 50% or less. In advanced medullary thyroid cancer, surgery is still the most effective option for early stage disease. Gary, how is medullary thyroid cancer diagnosed? Medullary thyroid cancer is usually diagnosed with presentation of a mass. Um, and unusual for thyroid cancer, but not unusual for medullary thyroid cancer, the thyroid masses or the lymph node metastasis may be discomforting. So they may present with a painful mass, even radiation to their ear. So those are common presenting symptoms. The other medullary thyroid carcinoma patients that present are those with the familial medullary thyroid cancers, which I'm not sure will be a component of our discussion right now. But these, uh, they may be the first uh, genetic incident in their family. So all patients that present with medullary thyroid carcinoma should be counseled with regards to genetic counseling and the impact of what genetic testing may mean to them and their family. Nafa, tell us, what are the, the most common uh, presenting features for medullary thyroid cancer? Um, so most common is still the, that the patients present a, a lump is noticed um, or it's incidentally found and then they get an FNA. But there are patients who get diarrhea um, from their medullary thyroid cancer or flushing uh, type symptoms. Or as Gary alluded to, if they have a familial um, syndrome, they can have uh, one of the multiple endocrine neoplasias, they can have symptoms from uh, that pheochromocytoma or hyperparathyroidism, and then the medullary is picked up secondarily. And uh, Manisha, are there common pathological features of medullary thyroid cancer? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, tissue diagnosis or the biopsy or surgical specimen, when you look under microscope, it's actually a type of carcinoma that's called neuroendocrine carcinoma. Uh, they stain specifically for a protein called chromogranin or synaptophysin. And then what makes it specific for medullary uh, among all neuroendocrine cancers is that they also stain for calcitonin and CEA. Great, important to know. Gary, let's touch upon the familial syndromes for just a minute. and. Um, Tell us about uh, the workup uh, for a patient where you suspect this. Well, a patient suspected of a familial medullary thyroid carcinoma will always be evaluated, at least in our program, in an interdisciplinary program. Uh, and so it will involve a medical endocrinologist, uh, a surgeon, genetic counselor, diagnostic imaging, uh, even social work supportive services, even just from the very, very beginning. Uh, these can be very comp complex patients, and uh, their disease process, as NIFA alluded to, they may present with their medullary thyroid carcinoma, or they may present with hyperparathyroidism, or they may present with uh, other manifestations of their disease, pheochromocytoma, uh, and so on. So. Uh, or they may present, for example, to their pediatrician and something may just not look right to them. Uh, and so they can have their phenotype and not even have any manifestations of their disease at that present time. Nefa, are there specific tests that need to be done? Um, so, um, like, I just want to uh, add to what Gary said. So, the MEN2B patients often will, um, the dentist will actually pick up on their neuromas and they get referred that way, or the pediatrician mm -hmm. notices something's funny and they're the index case, so nobody else in the family has anything. Um, but basically, when we see a patient with medullary thyroid cancer, of course, making sure our pathologist, um, because medullary thyroid cancers are rare, those patients really should be referred um, to centers because there are many, it, it's a complicated um, situation. And a place where you can have a genetics counselor. Um, all medullary thyroid cancers get RET testing um, once they meet with the genetics counselor and understand the implications. Um, family members should never be tested for a RET test unless the index case or the patient with the medullary thyroid cancer has been tested and is positive. And it's important that patients understand that because very often you'll have a whole family that comes in and they all have their RET test that's negative but the person who had the disease wasn't. So typically um, uh, patients will have um, once they've had their biopsy and it proven that it's medullary thyroid cancer, they'll have their RET testing, but that can take weeks to come back. 
back. So if the patient's going for surgery um, before your RET testing comes back, then ordering plasma metanephrines to make sure the patient does not have a pheochromocytoma prior to the surgeon operating on the neck. Um, and ensuring that um, a calcium is checked and a parathyroid hormone level because that would change the surgical approach and you can take care of the parathyroids potentially um, with the medullary thyroid cancer at the same time. So that's pre uh, pretty much our pre-op testing unless the patient can wait for the RET testing. And if it's negative, then you don't necessarily need those tests. And I'd also add too that ordering a serum calcitonin and, and CEA levels are important. I had two or three patients have been referred to me with diagnosis of neuroendocrine tumors and they had involvement in the neck, and I ordered calcitonin levels, and they're like over 4,000. So I think that's important that um, we check those levels um, to, to really verify that this is medullary thyroid carcinoma. So I think there's people that um, argue both ways, both in the American Thyroid Association and uh, NCCN, about whether or not we do preoperative testing with calcitonin, especially in the, in the face of a thyroid nodule. And worldwide, um, people discuss this. Um, but a lot of people will argue exactly what Frank is saying, which is let's get the levels um, beforehand. It's a, first of all, you're making sure that the neuroendocrine tumor is primary from the medullary, uh, from the neck. And um, second of all, that it gives a nice baseline pre-op. So I think it depends on what camp you come from. It's but, awesome. but the controversy is only for suspected sort of thyroid cancer where they don't have a tissue diagnosis. But if they do have tissue diagnosis of medullary thyroid cancer, then it's standard of care to obtain the tumor markers, which are calcitonin and CEA. Both. Yeah. Which right. they'll do on the fine needle aspirate in many cases. Yeah. Yep. But it's also important to realize that the calcitonin and CEA are not going to be affected immediately after the first surgical intervention. So Frank mentioned a calcitonin of 4,000 preoperatively, which I agree wholeheartedly with the whole panel, we want to get a baseline calcitonin and CEA. But many patients become very, very focused upon these numbers, and we have to counsel them. And many of the referring physicians that, you know, they'll see them three weeks postoperatively, and they'll check their calcitonin level, and it's down to 2,800, and they're, you know, they're concerned about distant disease, although they should have been evaluated for distant disease to start off with, at least with baseline imaging. But we need to realize that the half-life of these proteins is quite prolonged, and so we have to look for a nadir in a very, very prolonged fashion versus the differentiated thyroid cancer patients, which will have a very, very rapid response from a biomarker standpoint. Mm -hmm. When is the nadir for you, Gary? When, when is it that you feel like it really should be down to zero or undetectable. I mean, is, is, does it matter if it was a 10,000 person versus a 600? Or is it so, so and what, what is it? Is it a couple of months? I, I, don't, I don't check calcitonin for three months. Mm -hmm. 